The Four Requisites, September 18th, 1979. If you are a genuine Buddhist monk, your goal should be enlightenment. This was true for nine out of ten monks during the Lord Buddha's time. In the Pali Canon, there are many stories about the enlightened disciples who left their home and their possessions to become monks, because they saw nothing more important than enlightenment. They came from every social status. Kings, princes, aristocrats, wealthy men, merchants, commoners, paupers, and outcasts. The Lord Buddha didn't care which class his followers came from, because he was full of compassion for all beings. It's also true with his enlightened disciples. They weren't conceited or arrogant, which is the nature of the Gilesas. All the disciples had their hearts set on enlightenment, and faithfully followed the Tamma teaching. Some of them were kings and princes with lavish lifestyles. Their four requisites of living, food, shelter, clothing, and medication, were of the highest quality. When they became monks, they didn't take with them their old lifestyles. This was true with the Lord Buddha and his relatives. All they had were the four requisites of a monk, which relied on the generosity of donors. Sometimes there was plenty, sometimes very few, sometimes sophisticated and sometimes simple. It was all up to the givers, but they were happy with whatever they received, because they were faithful to the Tamma teaching even before they became enlightened. For the commoners and merchants who were used to a hard life, it was no problem for them. Those who were used to living in luxury and easy circumstances and had to abandon them were not deterred by the hardship. They willingly took up the monk's lifestyle. This is what a real monk should be. When you go to live in the forests and hills, there aren't many amenities you can take with you. You just have to make do with what you can find. I used to wander in the hills and forests myself, so I know what it was like. You get from the donors what they have, what they use, and what they eat. There is a huge difference between living in the town and living in the forest regarding the living requisites. So, I can imagine what it was like for the Lord Buddha and his disciples who usually lived in the forest, on a hill, or in a cave, and at least one kilometer away from a village or town. How could they find any comfort from these places? Their hearts, however, were faithfully following the Tamma before they became enlightened. They were striving for enlightenment with diligent effort and pure motives. This was how they practiced before they could become our refuge, Sankhang Saranangatami. As a Tamma practitioner, you should take only the Lord Buddha, his enlightened disciples, and the Tamma teaching as your refuge or role model. If you do, you won't be disappointed. When you're going through a lot of hardship from your practice, you should look to the Lord Buddha and his enlightened disciples for inspiration. They went through a lot of hardship. They didn't cop out. You have to think like this to make you tough and strong like them. In crossing the Varta Zangzara, the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, which is a boundless space of Dukkha, you'll have to go through a lot of adversity, just like the Lord Buddha and his enlightened disciples did. For the upper class, their hardships were much more severe than the merchants and commoners who were used to a life of hardship before becoming monks. It's difficult to adapt to a new lifestyle, but they were not deterred because of their unshakable faith in the Lord Buddha and his teaching. They used the four requisites of living to sustain their lives so that they could diligently practice for enlightenment. Besides the requisites, they were only interested in enlightenment. You should follow their examples because they're your role models. You shouldn't take anybody else as your role model, because nobody is wiser than the Lord Buddha and his enlightened disciples. You should be prepared to face the hardships that come from fighting the Gilesas, which have ruled over your jitta for a very long time. Your jitta is the Gilesas' headquarters. How can they not dominate your jitta? If you don't fight like the Lord Buddha and his enlightened disciples, how can you win? This world is full of hardships because all inhabitants, animals and humans, have to make a living and are surrounded by all sorts of dangers. The monks in this monastery are abundantly supplied with the requisites of living. There are lots of charitable people in this country who love to support monks who faithfully follow the Tamma teaching because it's a way for them to make lots of merit. That's why this monastery never lacks the requisites of living. Why then can't you follow the Tamma teaching and develop yourself to the utmost of your ability? 
You have to accept the hardships that arise from your practice that will free you from Dukkha. You have to be strong, resolute, and courageous, and totally commit yourself to this noble endeavor. You should always be mindful of your jitta, which is driven by the kilesas. Avidda Bhattiya Sankara means your thoughts are driven by Avidda. Listen to that. Avidda is the major force that drives your thoughts and perceptions through your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body. Avidda makes you cling to the visual objects, sounds, aromas, flavors, and tactile sensations, which cause mental pain and stress because you are not mindful of your jitta. You'll see this very clearly when you're enlightened. I've seen it, and I'm not bragging. When the going gets tough, you have to be tough and strong. When you become skillful and proficient with your practice, the hardships will diminish. It's only at the beginning stages of practice that it's hard. When you keep on practicing, you'll be skillful and competent. You'll be tough and strong, skillful and competent if you develop sati, banya, sattha, and vidya, which will generate the mental power to gradually eradicate the kilesas and dasava. You'll see that the kilesas, dharnha, and asava are generated in your jitta, and you'll see the way to destroy them. Don't ever think that the kilesas are anywhere else but in your jitta. The real Vartajaka is the jitta that ceaselessly revolves around the cycle of birth, aging, illness, death, and rebirth. I have realized this from my investigation with my sati and banya. I have no doubt that the cause of birth is avidza that is firmly embedded deep within my jitta to the extent where it's impossible to differentiate my jitta from avidza. This is a crucial fact. When you dig into your jitta, you'll see this principal driver of your ceaseless wandering and its followers that control your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body, as well as roba, vedana, sanya, sankara, and vinyarna. Everything you do is driven by the kilesas that flow out of your jitta to accumulate dukkha for you by your mistaken and unfounded opinions or ideas. These kilesas are driven by avidza, which is their master. For this reason, the Lord Buddha had to teach you to be earnest and resolute with your practice of mental development. You have to concentrate all your efforts and mindfulness at your jitta. Listen. The four Satibhattana, or four establishments of mindfulness, is the Tamma teaching that guarantees and certifies the Magga, Pala, and Nibbana, and the complete elimination of the Kilesas. The four Satibhattana and the four Aryazatta, or four noble truths, are the crucial teachings. Where are the four Satibhattana and the four Aryazatta? They are in your Jitta. So you have to exert yourself to the utmost of your ability and win in order to measure up to the Lord Buddha and his enlightened disciples. It's the Jitta that thinks endlessly whether you have Sati or not. This is natural for the Jitta that is under the control of Avidda. It is Avidda that drives this thinking. The Jitta thinks with craving or Samudaya 99% of the time if you're not watching it and a hundred percent if you're reckless. What does it think about? It perpetually thinks, becoming obsessed with love, hatred, anger, sadness, happiness, the past and the future. How can it find any peace of mind when it's deluded? Right now you can't comprehend this. That's why you have to develop calm for your jitta. When it becomes calm, you should investigate with banya the first of the four objects of Satipatthana, which is the body, to clearly see its true nature. What's this body made of? You have to continually and mindfully probe the body, not casually, occasionally, and carelessly, which is the way of the Gelesas and Samudaya. This is not the way to investigate the four Satipatthanas for the purpose of eliminating the Upadana or attachment to the body. If you investigate with mindfulness or Sati, how can you not see the body's true nature? How did the Lord Buddha get to see his body and the bodies of others? How did he become Loka Vidu, one who knows the world? His enlightened disciples are also Loka Vidu, but the scope of the Lord Buddha's knowledge is far more extensive and profound. Loka Vidu means being enlightened to the four noble truths that shake the foundations of the world. Every living being is cursed or blessed with the Four Noble Truths, depending on which parts of the truth it's exposed to. If you develop Zati and Banya, you're exposed to the good truth, because it's the path to the cessation of suffering. 
If you develop craving and suffering, you're exposed to the bad truths. Craving and stress are inherent in every living being that still revolves around the Vartadzakka, the cycle of birth, death and rebirth, because they are driven by Abhidha. It is therefore imperative to investigate the body's true nature, starting from the skin, to see clearly both sides of the skin, outside and inside, that are quite different. The Lord Buddha said it is Bhartikula, or filthy. The outer part of the skin is dirty with sweat and grime from top to bottom. When the body decomposes, it will be filthier. When it's alive, it's wrapped with the skin to make it look attractive. But when you flip the skin inside out, you wouldn't want to look at it, be it the body of a man or a woman. The skin will deceive the eyes of undiscerning people. It's a very thin layer of skin, and yet you're not capable of penetrating it. How can you say that you have banya or wisdom? The Lord Buddha had penetrated it, and so had the Salvakas, because they had banya. You have to look at the truth. Don't deny it by seeing something that's ugly as beautiful, something that's repulsive as attractive, something that's impermanent as permanent, and something that's not I and mine as I and mine. If you're constantly contradicting the Lord Buddha's teaching, it means you can't fight the Gelesas, because when the Gelesas tell you to reject the Tamma teaching, you'll promptly oblige. The Gelesas will always oppose the Tamma teaching because they are adversaries, so you must always resist the Gelesas. When you see, hear, smell, taste, feel, or think about something that will give rise to the Gelesas, you must stop. You have to restrain yourself. You also have to search for the kilesis that are hiding inside your jitta. If you want to investigate filthiness or particula, you have to look inside your body. Is there a single part that isn't filthy? There isn't, because the whole body is filthy. It's also a nitang dukkang and anatta. Will you still keep clinging to it? The Lord Buddha's teaching is the means of removing your delusion and makes you see the truth. You have to apply this Tamma teaching in your practice and not allow the Gelesas to constantly hurt you. The Gelesas are having a lot of fun, and you are having a lot of Dukkha because you are under their influence and power. You have to really investigate the body, yours and others. The body has no awareness. It has the five sense organs, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body, to receive the five sense data. But these five sense organs are not the jitta, the one who knows. Only the practitioner of mental development will realize this truth. You'll see that the body is just a medium. When the jitta detaches from it, there will be no sense objects for the jitta to perceive. Normally, the jitta will suffuse over the entire body, and thereby shoulder the burden of the body with all the filth inside it, and shoulder the burden of I and mine because the jitta is deluded. That's why the Lord Buddha had to teach you to investigate the body in order to see the truth of Bhartikula, Asupha, Anitsang, Dukkang, and Anatta. The body is always changing. There isn't a single instant when the Telakkana or the three characteristics of Anitsang, Dukkang, and Anatta stop working. Anitsang or impermanence works around the clock. Dukkang constantly oppresses you. Anatta is not self. Is there really I or mine? These truths are staring at you. You have to investigate with Banya to see these truths. When you see them, your delusion and attachment to the body will be severed automatically. You'll also see that the visible objects, sounds, aromas, flavors, and tactile sensations are Anitzang, Dukkang, and Anatta. After you've let go of your attachment to your body, you'll still look after it, but you won't consider it to be I or mine. The jitta now knows that it's the jitta, and is fully contented. It doesn't need anything to make it happy. Vedana is Vedana, the jitta is the jitta, dukkha sulkha and neutral Vedana is merely Vedana, they are anitsang dukkhang and anatta. You should listen when you chant Vedana Anitta, Vedana Anatta. When it's Sukha, it's Anatta. When it's Dukkha, it's also Anatta. When it's neutral, it's also Anatta. Similarly with Anitzang. What is there to cling to? 
These phenomena rise and cease because it's their nature to do so. Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, and Vinyana are just phenomena. The jitta is the jitta. How can the jitta cling to these phenomena and take them as itself? If it still does, it will unknowingly be like a football kicked around by the Gelesas to take up birth in the various realms of existence, like a blind person who doesn't know where he's going because he can't see. Wherever he is led, he will follow. Wherever the jitta is led by the Gelesas, it will follow. But it doesn't know where it's going and has to experience a lot of dukkha, like the dukkha of your body at the time of illness, old age, and death. Please, don't ever think that your body will bring you true happiness. It will eventually become a heap on the fire. If there is attachment to your body or ubadana, the dukkha will be excruciating due to your delusion. So you have to investigate to see the truths of anittang, asulpa, and partikula. You can investigate either your body or someone else's body. Do it repeatedly. At first you look at the pleasant and beautiful aspect of the body to fool the gelesas. Then you have to look at it when it decomposes and disappears, until you see it vividly in your jitta, and let it go. This attachment to your body is very heavy, heavier than a mountain. How can you say that a mountain is heavy? Have you ever lifted a mountain? Has a mountain ever weighed down on you? It has never burdened you, because it keeps to itself. But your body is a very heavy burden. The Lord Buddha said, Para have banza kantha. The five kantas are a very heavy burden. The Lord Buddha didn't say that the mountain was a heavy burden, but he did say it of the five kantas. This is where you have to investigate your body and someone else's body. Look at it when it comes into being and when it disappears. How can the Kilesas consider themselves to be an entity, pleasant and attractive? This perception contradicts the Thamma teaching. You have to investigate to see the truth. Then you will be able to eliminate the Kilesas. The notion of beauty, pleasantness, permanence, I and mine will all vanish. The attachment to the body will disappear and the heavy burden removed from the jitta, which will then rise up to freedom. This is how you should investigate earnestly and diligently. The Mugga, Pala and Nibbana are here and now in the jitta. The Kilesas are also here and now. They can appear any time. Love, hatred, and delusion can appear any time, whenever there is an opportunity for them to appear. They are not subject to time or ritual. In practicing Thamma, you shouldn't pick the time, consult an astrological chart, choose the postures of your exertion, or perform rituals. You should concentrate your investigation at the place where the Gelezes appear. What are they thinking about? Banya must find out exactly what's going on. When you've investigated repeatedly, you'll see it clearly. This was how I practiced. I have great concern for all my students because our living together is not certain. We are all Anitzang Dukkang and Anatta, and we are living in a world of Anitzang Dukkang and Anatta. So how can we find any certainty? There must always be parting from one another, either while we're still alive or when we pass away. So. While we are still living together, you have to really exert yourself, putting all your efforts into it, and get something out of it. Don't let our living together be in vain. There's nothing in this world that can be a greater memorial than the enlightening Tamma. All you have to do is to get the Tamma into your jitta to completely extinguish the fires of the Gelezas, Dharnha, and Asava, which drive the jitta recklessly and uncontrollably. You'll then have completely rid yourself of all burdens and accomplished your most grueling endeavor, which the Lord Buddha proclaimed as Vositang Brahma Zariang, and your jitta will have realized absolute freedom. You'll no longer have to seek happiness, be bothered with the past, the future, birth, death, or rebirth, because you will be absolutely contented. But right now your jitta is very hungry, restless, agitated, and constantly seeking and grasping due to the influence of the Gilesas. Can't you see their harm? After you have completely eliminated the Gilesas, this grasping, restlessness, and agitation will all disappear. Then you won't have to waste your time worrying about the past or the future, about birth, death, and rebirth, or about happiness and sadness, because you've become enlightened, perfectly contented, 
and you've purified your jitta. This is the reward of your toilsome undertaking that has come to completion. From this point on, your meditation practice will be for recreation purposes only. Your body can get tired, but your purified jitta won't. It won't gain or lose or be afraid of birth or death, because it isn't born and doesn't die. The Lord Buddha and his enlightened disciples practiced walking or sitting meditation for rest and recreation to minimize the burden of the body on the jitta. They would meditate as they liked. Some could enter into the various levels of mental absorption or tāna samāpatti, like the Venerable Maha Kassapa, who could enter into tāna samāpatti for seven days at a time. He could enter into the deepest absorption called nirodha samāpatti, or complete cessation of all mental activities. For those who couldn't do this, they just calmed their jitta. They meditated not to eliminate the gilesas. What gilesas are there to be eliminated when all of them have been completely removed? The jitta is now purified. What is there to purify? This purified jitta is no longer affected by time and place. It doesn't matter how the body should die, by accident or illness, or if the jitta has entered into samadhi before the body dies or not because nothing can affect or destroy this purified jitta. The reason why the Lord Buddha entered into Tāna Samābhati before his final passing away, or Paranibbāna, was to show his accomplishment as the world's greatest teacher. After his enlightenment, he taught the world with the wisdom and compassion of a great spiritual teacher, and made himself a perfect role model. Therefore, before he was to finally pass away, he showed his accomplishment by entering the first, second, third, and fourth chana, which are the Rūpatanas. He then entered the four Arūpatanas and Nirotha Samabhati, the complete cessation of all mental activities. At that time, some of his enlightened disciples wondered whether he had already passed away. So they asked the Venerable Anuruddha, who had the ability to read the minds and thoughts of others. No one could surpass the Venerable Anuruddha in this respect. Some of the enlightened disciples also possessed this ability, but they were not as good as the Venerable Anuruddha, who was able to follow the jitta of the Lord Buddha going through the various stages of Tana. When the Lord Buddha entered the level of Sunya Reda Nirodha, the complete cessation of all mental activities, the other disciples couldn't tell whether the Lord Buddha had already passed away. So they asked the Venerable Anuruddha, who was constantly monitoring the Lord Buddha's jitta. He said, no, not yet. He's in the level of sunya reda yeta nirodha. The Venerable Anuruddha continued to tell the other disciples the movement of the Lord Buddha's jitta that went through the various levels of tāna, and finally passed away between the rūpatānas and arūpatānas. He didn't pass away in any of the tānas because he wasn't attached to them. The Venerable Anuruddha then told the others, He has now passed away and entered Nibbāna, where nothing more can be said. This is like flying in an aircraft in the sky that is totally empty of any clouds, where it's not possible to tell how fast the plane is actually going if not looking at the speedometer. It seems like the aircraft isn't moving at all. It's the same with the purified zitta that's free from all conventional truths or sammati. All the tanas, from the first through the eighth and nirodhasamapati, are sammati. The purified jitta that's completely free from all conventional truth is called vimutti. Whilst the vimutti jitta or purified jitta of the Lord Buddha entered any level of chana, it was possible for the Venerable Anuruddha to track. He could tell the other disciples about the jitta of the Lord Buddha as it entered and exited the various levels of chana. But when this purified jitta exited samadhi, it was like an aircraft flying in empty space with nothing to serve as a point of reference. You can't tell how fast you're going, but if there are some clouds, you can. It's the same with the jitta that passes beyond samadhi. You have to investigate thoroughly to see that the five kantas are merely the jitta's embodiment or avatar. When the jitta is detached from this embodiment or avatar, it will be detached from all samadhi. So it's not possible to describe this jitta with the language of samadhi. You can't say that it's here or there. Where does the purified jitta originate from, if not from your jitta that is currently being shrouded by the kilesas? Where are the kilesas? They're in your jitta. And where are the magga, pala, nibbana, and purity, if not in your jitta? This is what you have to purify. 
You mustn't go after other things, because you'll be wasting your time. Don't speculate, but go straight to the truth in your jitta. Why do you only hear about the other practitioners attaining to freedom from dukkha and attaining to magga, pala, and nibbana at this place or that place? Why can't you attain freedom? They are human beings just like you are. The tamma teaching that they use to eliminate the gilesas are the same tamma teaching that you're using. Their gilesas and your gilesas are the same gilesas. Why can't you eliminate them? The problem is really in your ability. The Tamma teaching is not the problem because it's complete and perfect. It can always eliminate the Gilesas. The problem is with you, the practitioner, who applies this Tamma teaching. How do you apply it? Do you apply it with weakness and fear of pain and hardship? If this is the case, you'll not succeed. Even when you're fully armed, your enemies can still destroy you if you don't fight them with your weapons. Even when you can memorize all the Tamma teaching, it will be useless because the Gilesas are not afraid. They're only afraid of your practice of Sadha, Virya, Sati, Samati, and Banya. The Gilesas are always afraid of the Tamma. They were afraid during the Lord Buddha's time. They are afraid now, and they will be afraid in the future. So you have to really commit yourself to the practice. Don't ever relent or give up.